It's episode 179 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. And I uh, really appreciate it if you'd go over and click on the subscribe button over in the right-hand sidebar. It helps other people find the show. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week. Uh, thirdscribe.com is there to connect you, writers and readers, uh, together. If you are a writer, you know that you need a, an author platform. You need a place where people can find you, read your books, buy your books, connect with you, and the same thing with readers. You can connect with some of your favorite authors at thirdscribe.com. Please tell them that Hank sent you. Also, uh, the new book by Aaron Saylor, Sewerville, a southern gangster novel. It's like The Sopranos in Appalachia. Uh, rises at times to lyrical beauty, says author Mark Rubenstein. A small-time hood tries to escape the family business in this powerful story of crime and drug abuse in rural America. Sewerville is violent and profane, but in the end, it's also deeply moving. Considered an essential tale of modern crime in the American South. Pick it up on Amazon.com. There's a link in the show notes. I'd also like to thank Daniel Arthur Smith and the great folks at Tales from the Canyons of the Dam. There's a brand new episode out. Go pick it up today. Click on the link to Ed Gosney's blog over the right-hand sidebar, Cool Comics in My Collection, and uh, go check out what Ed is doing. He's doing some fantastic work over there, and let him know that you heard about him on Author Stories. Also, if you're an author, uh, there has been a lot of talk lately about changes to Amazon's algorithms and the way that they handle certain things. Uh, now might be a good time for you to consider taking your book wide to as many retailers as as possible draft to digital can help you do that go to draft to digital.com slash author stories and see how they can help you take your book to as many people as possible i'm going to do a special live youtube hangout with kevin tumlinson from draft to digital and we're going to talk about taking your book wide and answering your questions and all sorts of fun stuff there. There's going to be a link to that live event down in the show notes. Uh, go ahead and set your calendar for it. Don't forget to stay tuned after the episode for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' Jason Crane series. Now on to our show. Six String, the new book by Stefan Boltz. Jennifer Dalton dreamed of being a singer for as long as she could remember. The dream has kept her alive throughout a childhood mired in poverty in a broken and abusive home. When her younger brother dies and her mother takes refuge in alcohol, the emotional toll becomes unbearable. One morning she runs away, taking with her the one thing she owns, her beloved six string guitar. This is the story of a girl finding herself alone in the good and the bad, the friends she makes, and a choice that can rob her of everything she's won. Six String by Stefan Boltz, now available on Amazon.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, Gary Schwartz is with me, and uh, you may not recognize Gary's book yet, uh, but... I'm very sure that you have seen or heard Gary uh, around <laughs> at some point. Um, Gary, we're going to get into uh, your fantastic and fantastically varied uh, history in just a minute. But I start each show with uh, the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or wanting to be a storyteller? Well, actually, it start did when I was 11 years old um, and I had this idea uh, after having read uh, one of my favorite books The Phantom Toll Booth and um, oh, yeah. I um, I had this idea uh, at, at age 11 and I thought I could write a story like The Phantom Toll Booth and I've always had that idea in the back of my mind so it began there awesome um now, at age 11, uh, when you read that, you know, there's this, there's this weird thing with people who are naturally inclined uh, storytellers that uh, we read something and, you know, the first reaction is, oh, I can do that. You know, that's <laughs> that's no big deal. You know, and then the and then the actual doing of the thing is a little more humbling uh, than that. Usually there's uh, 
<laughs> you know th- that humility is you earned said it, brother <laughs> right by by trying to do the thing that that you know in your heart you could actually do um but so so what was the um what was the first step at that uh toward that that you uh you know started uh working to be the thing that you knew you could be well you know it's interesting that 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 initial idea uh i i kept with me for a long time and i and i only told it orally uh i only told it orally um because um i was i was actually learning to be a performer uh, when I was 13 years old, and uh, uh, I did a lot, I wrote a lot of sketches and a lot of other funny types of pantomimes and things like that. But every chance I got, I would say, you know, I had this idea for a story, and I would tell sort of the beginning of it. Um, and I did that for 52 years until I was in my 60s uh, with wow. with that one story. Uh, in the interim, of course, you know, I became an actor and a performer, and I, I wrote scripts and other stories, but um, never wrote a book. Never wrote a book before, a full-length book. Well, uh, I think you uh, are, uh, are are well entitled uh, to be uh, titled storyteller uh, at any point <laughs> during all that. Um, but um, your your bio says that your professional career began at age thirteen. Yeah. Um, what happened there? Well, uh, I, I became a professional mime at the age of 13, and um, uh, I toured the uh, upstate New York area with Pete Seeger um, on the Clearwater Sloop, uh, going up and down the Hudson River with a, a teenage mime troupe, um, performing uh, pantomimes. Uh, while Pete Seeger would amass these great crowds on the riverbank of the Hudson River to clean up the river. This was back in the 60s. So that was my first introduction to uh, performing and actually writing my own material, which at that point I had stolen from TV with uh, from, from, from my idols, Red Skelton and Dick Van Dyke and Danny Kay. Right. At thirteen, did you have any clue the um, the weight uh, of what you were doing with someone like Pete Seeger? No, I just thought it was totally cool, and uh, I had uh, you know I I had basically it was a great respite from you know uh, my 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 family situation. So I I spent the summer out on my own enjoying myself, and it was um, it was just absolutely. Uh, idyllic as i remember it wow where did you grow up i grew up in schenectady new york upstate new york okay gotcha uh and uh during the 60s uh you know i I think we would probably be very reticent to send a 13 year old um you know out (laughs) kind of on their (laughs) own for the summer doing something like that now uh you know the the world was a very different place then absolutely absolutely yeah it it was and you know it was sort of the you know uh, the dawning of the summer of love coming up and woodstock wasn't too far off so what uh how long did you do that just for a summer well, i did or, that for uh, the summer yeah i spent i spent uh the summer touring uh, uh up and down the hudson river and um performing with this mime troupe and then went back to my life uh it was really kind of interesting but by that time i had really been hooked as a performer and i started performing uh at school and getting involved in in, in things like that um and it was interesting how I became a, a how I got involved in in my drama club was my school was very intent that all of the kids go to college, so it was imperative back then you took personal typing, and of course that was the very first elective class that got filled up, and I never was able to take personal typing, so I had to settle for taking a speech class, and um, <laughs> I would do these speeches based on these comedy albums that I was listening to. Uh, and um, m- the speech teacher said, you should try out for the drama club. And I did and, and uh, ended up being in a lot of plays and really enjoying acting. Yeah. 
Um, there, there's something uh, that you said there that just uh, kind of stuck out to me. Uh, I remember as a kid listening to comedy albums <laughs> uh, and records, you know, especially. Uh, now, m- my kids uh, wouldn't. I, that that would be foreign to them, you know. If you watch stand up comedy, well, you, you watch stand up comedy. You, you know, there's a Netflix special, oh, there's yeah. something on YouTube, or whatever. There's uh, there's something lost about listening um, to to how a performer performs and the uh, the cadence and the rhythm of delivery, Absolutely. and things like that. That and the that I think is of com- jokes. Exactly, exactly. And uh, there, there's something to listening to that and closing your eyes and imagining that you're there um, that uh, I can completely see the connection there between that and then uh, acting and uh, learning that. So that was very important. To absolutely, you. absolutely. And it gave me kind of a uh, not only a voice, but I was really good with mimicry. So I would really study the 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 comedy stylings of a Woody Allen or a Bob Newhart and get exactly how they delivered their material. And that was very helpful when you're creating a, a voice or, you know, painting pictures with your just words. Right, right. So uh, so you, you started taking classes and uh, this was, uh, did you start seeing that this was something that you could make a career of? Not at first, no. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I grew up... Uh, my parents were uh, of a mind that uh, nobody goes and makes a living in show business, and that's a ridiculous thing to even consider. So uh, I, I ended up uh, going into the uh, restaurant business, uh, and I was a bartender for seven years. But I could not shake the performing bug, and I would perform for my customers at my bar. Um, and it, it really nice. took a, um, you know, a, a terrible car accident and one of those life changing experiences to show me that, you know, I was headed on the wrong track. And even though that uh, an uncertain life in show business was um, not advisable, it was really the only thing that was going to make me happy. So at age 27, I decided I would become a poverty stricken mime. <laughs> There's a lot of call for mime. Yes, I was. I, I communicated <laughs> with a with an Israeli mime who had a kibbutz in Boulder, Colorado, and I was going to go live on a mountaintop and do pantomime and study the Kabbalah. Like <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, of course, yeah, like and do. just take a vow of poverty. And I figured, you know, that was the best I could do. Well, when I got to Colorado, of course, he had uh, flown the coop because somebody offered him a real job. And uh, I just basically headed out to visit my sister who lived in Los Angeles and set myself up as a bartender again and started performing again for my customers. And also in Los Angeles, there were a lot of other places to perform. And that's when I got into show business. What was that? uh, What was the first thing that that you did uh, in Los Angeles that uh, that gave you the confidence to keep going? Well, I would go to these coffee houses um, that were in Hollywood at the time. Uh, this was like just before the comedy stand up comedy boom happened in the early seventies. And, um, I would start performing, uh, my, my, uh, pantomime routines. And someone said, well, you should go visit this, um, a guy, uh, Richmond Shepherd, a mime teacher. And, um, if he likes you, he'll get you work. So I went there and Sure enough, I became part of his company. Uh, In his company, I met my partner, uh, Caleb Chung, and we became the comedy team of Schwartz and Chung. And we worked for about 17 years doing physical comedy um, until um, we both went our separate ways and I on to a voice acting career and he on to a toy inventing career. Caleb invented the Furby. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you becoming a mime is a, is an interesting uh, side road to me. Uh, I'm always fascinated by 
the um uh very rarely do i have guests that say uh you know i wanted to be a writer therefore i studied writing and i started writing now i am a successful writer <laughs> um usually there are these really interesting turns and twists that that get people to where they are and i think those are the most fascinating uh, parts of the story uh but uh you know uh, as someone who went on to have a successful voice acting career, yeah. uh, then as a uh, you know as a, uh, a middle grade novelist, <laughs> uh, miming is uh, is foreign to both of those. It would seem uh, because you're not communicating with your voice, you're not communicating with your words and your inflection, uh, and and all of those things that we think of as a voice actor or you know or a writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're doing the exact opposite. You're telling a story without using words. Uh, can, can you draw a connection between that and, and then what you later went on to do? And do you feel that miming uh, added to your skill set? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you think about it, what a mime does is he shows you in your imagination pictures that aren't there. Ah, okay. And – So if you're a a mime of any skill whatsoever, it's not just choreography. You actually have to envision the environment you create and respond to it. And you do the same thing in front of a written page, a, a blank page. You sit there and you say, what do I see? What do I react to? And as, as, as vivid as I can create my invisible world for my audience as a mime, you know, the, the skill is actually the same thing. The imagination is actually the same thing. The execution is very different, obviously, if you're writing. But you definitely right. have to see where you are and what you're doing and what's happening to you. And um, I think that's, that's uh, I mean, that's, to me, the the fun of writing. Yeah. I, I've never thought about that comparison uh, between miming and the blank page. Uh, both of them, you're creating worlds uh, that the audience does not expect. And then you're uh, inserting them into that world with and you. And seeing them um, in their imagination rather than in reality. I mean, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the printed page and an empty space are so similar. Right. That's great. That's a great comparison. Um, where does one find work as a mime? <laughs> <laughs> well, other than on street corners, um, I, I actually got a job uh, for about, um, oh, I don't know, a pretty good job, actually. It paid a great hourly wage. I was a mime on the on the Queen Mary, uh, the... the uh, the ship that's moored in Long Beach, California, and is uh, at that time was a Hyatt hotel, and uh, they had a lot. It was a tourist uh, uh, attraction, and they had a lot of foreign tourists who didn't speak any English, and they needed entertaining while touring the ship. So uh, they hired mimes, wow. and uh, I, cool. I just uh, you know was uh, uh, I was what they called a zany bow mime. And there were the bill drafts, <laughs> and there were the first class cabin uh, people who were mimes in tuxedos doing robots. And, uh, you know, it was a cheap way to get animatronics on board. Right. Right. Um, from there, you uh, and you mentioned earlier that your uh, your uh, association that, uh, that led to a, a, a long term uh um, comedy career uh, with my comedy comedy career yes thank you for um for finishing my words um that uh it seems like that that these are natural progressions that as you uh as you're going through and and learning more uh that that there are always other forms of expression close by if we just have our eyes open uh and be willing to try new things were were these and then you you then went on to teach yeah. uh you are these uh I, I think we rarely you know set out to do a particular thing but uh but there are there are options uh, all along the way if we're if we're just open to it um would you like to speak to that for just a minute well yeah uh you know i had been a mime uh for more than uh, by the time i was in my mid 20s i had been a mime already 20, uh, 13 years and uh, i was getting tired of not talking 
And so I started uh, <laughs> wanting to uh, expand my uh, abilities. And so I started studying acting. And I was lucky enough to run across a woman named Viola Spolin, who is the woman who invented the art form of improvisation in America. She and her son started the Second City in Chicago. Right. And she was one of the most influential people in my life. Uh, she changed my whole life. And uh, um, I became, over the years, uh, her protege. And I studied improvisation and uh, finally got permission from her to teach her work, which I have done and still do all around the world. And I've written extensively on her work as well. Um, so um, that sort of uh, unlocked for me a whole new dimension of performing and a whole new understanding of myself as a human being. Um, and, and that really sort of uh, led me to, you know, uh, a better a more successful show business career than just animating uh, robot suits and being in prosthetic makeups and things like that. I, um, uh, and then I started getting work as a voice actor and just by dumb luck got involved in one of the best um, uh, looping groups, uh, voice, voice acting groups in Los Angeles. Now looping is where the actors, uh, uh, are tell when they shoot a movie or a film or a TV show, all of the extras in the uh, scene are told to actually be quiet and not say anything because they're recording the major actors. And then later on, when the movie's all cut together, they have to re-record what the background people might have said. And they bring in improvising actors to watch the movie and fill those voices in. And that was a job that I did for 16 years in Los Angeles as a voice actor. Oh, wow. I never knew that existed. Yeah. It's a Much less that you could have job. a career doing it. Yeah, that's that's and fascinating. And you have to know all sorts of amazing little factoids in order to sound authentic because the directors are right there making sure that you don't ruin their movie by saying uh, inappropriate things. So, right. for example, I worked for... Um, uh, 14 years on the Star Trek series, and of course, being a fan, I knew, I knew all of what they call techno babble. I knew, right. I knew bridge terminology. I knew the navigation. I knew what warp core formulas were. Um, I knew all. I knew my way around the sick bay and engineering. And you have to know all of those things to sound really authentic. Um, so I got a job, uh, you know, providing the voices for all of the extras on Star Trek. Uh, that is crazy. It's an amazing That's job. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and and of course your uh, your ability to do that uh, comes from those chops that you earned uh, doing improv, uh, which came from your chops that you uh, earned doing mime and 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 so forth right. and so on. Uh, and in just about any artistic endeavor, uh, acting, writing, uh, you know, uh, musicianship. Uh, Improv is uh, uh, being able to think on your feet and to kind of keep the story going in new and fresh directions at any moment is crucially important. Right, right. Basically, improv is the is the ability to uh, allow yourself to be spontaneous and not premeditated, and um, you know that serves you well, especially in a first draft of a book, for example. When you know, I'm I'm. I'm not one of those writers that outlines. Um, I, I, I just have to sort of follow my pen to the end. And then the work is that much harder to sort of organize it. But I just have to see where it goes. And that's the same thing you do in improv. You have to see where you're going and not plan ahead. And uh, that's right. a little that's been a little trick for me as a writer to um, I'm trying to. Um, you know, it, it makes my it makes writing harder, actually, uh, from what I'm told. I came to, you know, uh, formal writing, novel writing late in life. I, I had written scripts and I've written uh, routines and small bits, but never an extended piece. Um, and uh, so, you know, a lot of writers like to start with an outline and I like to see where the story goes and then sort of back myself into an outline. 
Right, right. And I think there's a lot of people like that, and um, uh, which brings us to your book. Um, you have a, a, a new book out called The King of Average. Right. Uh, and this is a middle grade book. Um, but before we get specifically into the book, how did you come to working with this age group? Uh, I know that you, you worked uh, in television yeah. uh, for, for children and for children, this age. How did, how did that come before, about? I mean, even when I was a mime, uh, I made my bread and butter money uh, doing school assemblies, believe it or not, with my partner uh, before I sort of hit the big time and uh, got into the union. My partner and I wrote a grant called Mime as a Second Language, and we went into all of the uh, non-English speaking schools in Los Angeles and did pantomime uh, shows. Um, so, um, but um, so we've I've always worked with kids, and um, I've always had an affinity for kids. Um, uh, they're the best audience. Uh, as a matter of fact, when, when I asked her if I could teach child, uh, uh, teach her work, she said, well, you have to start by teaching children because they will be your best instructors. They right. show you exactly what's needed without any subterfuge. So I, I completely yeah. agree. And so when a kid has an ego problem or is afraid or fear, they don't cover it up. So it's obvious what they need for you as a teacher to help them out. And it's just um, it's very rewarding to see kids sort of blossom, uh, you know, when you when you're able to help them like that. And uh, I've always wanted to do that. I've always enjoyed doing that. And I've always enjoyed making kids laugh. Yeah. Uh, and and ki- I think some people think uh, that uh, you know maybe I'll write a kids book and that'll be the easy way uh, you know to get uh, to get a book written and it is exactly the opposite writing for kids uh, like you said they they are your most honest audience they uh, can be fickle but when you strike on something that they love they really they love absolutely it. love it and uh, they can tell when you're being <laughs> condescending or when you, you know you're doing something that's you know they, they they can pick up on that you have to be you know on their level right right um so you worked in children's television what what kind of stuff did you work on well i did a tv show the very first year cable television came out for the disney channel called you and me kid which was a, uh, uh, we were part of something called You and Me Theater, and we told interactive stories for preschoolers. And so we got to little minute vignettes on, you know, the, uh, the princess in the pea, uh, the frog in the well, all, all sorts of little funny stories. And I got a chance to use all of my voices and all of my physicality for kids, which is great. And then later on, um, I got a job on a wonderful television series in the 1980s called Zoobly Zoo. Uh, with Ben Vereen. It was a Hallmark uh, channel. It was a Hallmark production, and it was a, sort of Hallmark's answer to Sesame Street. And it was about these Zubel characters headed by Ben Vereen, who played a magical leopard, Mayor Ben, uh, who lived in Zubli Zoo, a little village, and they each had different artistic skills. There was Builder Beaver, uh, who w- could invent things. There was Lookout Bear, a young adventurous bear. And I ran the local theater, and my name was Bravo Fox. And I used the voice of Ed Wynn. <laughs> so I was Bravo Fox, and they said, you know, he has to be an egomaniacal, supercilious person, but still lovable. And you can't go wrong with the voice of Ed Wynn for lovability. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Um so as as you're uh as you're working on these shows uh and and you're doing all this work with this age group um surely you had the idea along the way uh sometime to write a book uh for kids uh how come now well it's interesting uh if you want to go back to the roots of the of of, of why I came up with the idea it's because I grew up in a um a very chaotic family environment. So um, I I had, there was a lot of abuse and a lot of neglect uh, as I was growing up, and I sort of uh, had to struggle 
to uh, you know become a human being um, uh, that could pass for a human being uh, as a kid because I, I really didn't have any models at home. Um, so with that, and what happens is uh, when, when kids grow up in that kind of a situation, they tend to create a, a, a false self, a self that they present to the world. And mine happened to be something very socially acceptable, a happy-go-lucky, entertaining little kid who was pretty nice. Um, but that was not. But as I grew up and as I got more involved in understanding myself as an actor, I realized. I mean, I hit, I hit a lot of psychological roadblocks, and I read a book called "The Drama of the Gifted Child" about children of neglect during my therapy. Uh, luckily, I was able to afford a lot of good therapy uh, having had succeeded as an actor. And um, uh, Alice Miller wrote a book called The Drama of the Gifted Child about children who create false selves to benefit, you know, either an abusive parent or to just present an acceptable uh, person to the world when they feel unloved or unwanted and that was exactly my situation um, so when I decided to write The King of Average um, I wanted to write it literally about um, my journey from my the, the, the constructed self I created for myself uh, to um, a place of authenticity so in a strange way it's a parable about, about my own uh, psychotherapy. As uh, as most good books uh, for that age group, there's something deeper than the story on the surface, uh, and and it sounds like the King of Average is is exactly the same way. There's a there's a story that you're wanting to tell, absolutely. While while uh, engaging. Uh, with someone in this age group and bringing them the story in a way um, that they can process, they can enjoy it, uh, but maybe take something away from it. Uh, talk about the challenge in balancing those two things, because we, we are talking about very deep and heavy subject matter, um, but the, the book is really engaging and fun. Yeah. Um, how, how, do you, how do you make those two things happen side by well, side? Well, again, uh, you know, first of all, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to capture a kid's attention unless you're funny. And, right. uh, it's, it's a fun read. And, uh, again, I grew up, uh, watching Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, and I've always appreciated the fact that the humor of Rocky and Bullwinkle worked on two levels. It worked on the level of it was a very funny and silly cartoon with funny characters, but it was also quite a social satire on the Cold War back in the 60s. Right. And I didn't get that until I kept watching it as an adult and saw that, wow, these guys are sharp. And uh, that's always been the the... the the, the deal with my humor, um, especially with kids, um, you know, you have to you have to make them laugh. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, without without uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, without a serious undertone or without a message. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson has to be learned, but uh, through having uh, the, the experience of enjoying it rather than being good for you. Right, right. Or you come off heavy-handed or preachy, exactly. or you know, and, and all of those things. That's a lesson, that, and not a and not a story. Right, and an eleven-year-old will spot that immediately and run far away. Absolutely. from Absolutely, <laughs> my teacher Viola used to call that "Don't be the benevolent dictator." <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, when you uh, well, first off, you mentioned earlier that you uh, that you're not an outliner, uh, and so did you, you. This was kind of a parable about you um, 
how did you begin the project and, and how did it uh, kind of flow out from there? I, I guess what, what was the decision point where you you finally said, OK, I'm going to write this book now? Um, it, well, like I said, um, uh, for years and years, I would tell everybody I've had this great idea about a similar Phantom Tollbooth style story about a, a little boy who encounters a scapegoat named Mayor Culpa, because I always loved the wordplay that Norton Juster used. And uh, Mayor Culpa was a uh, scapegoat who took the blame for everything. And uh, uh, as, I, as I sort of told everybody the story, they said, oh, what a wonderful idea for a story. And I tried writing it for, I think I got 20 pages in for over a decade. I never got past 20 pages. And then it was 2008. I was at a Christmas dinner with a, with a corporate trainer guy. And I told him the story, and they were all urging me, well, you should write it. And I said, yeah, 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 I should write it. I should write it. And he challenged me. He said, look, I tell you what, I bet you could write one page a day for a month. Show me 30 pages at the end of the month. And I told him, you're on. And so I sat down to write past my 20-page beginning and ended up in like three months with a 360-page manuscript. It just flowed out. Wow. You can never uh, discount the, uh, the importance of a good challenge sometimes. That's, that's what it took. <laughs> it was an ex- it was a, I needed to become accountable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know that exact feeling. You know, you, you, you walk around and you tell people, I've, uh, I have a story in me. I know I do. Uh, and, and until somebody says, well, why don't you shut up about it and write it? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it becomes a yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. So, so what did you? Uh, okay. So you get the the story finished. Then what do you? Well, do with I it? was so thrilled uh, that I had written a a full length manuscript. I started showing it to everybody, expecting them to be as excited as I was, right. and uh, they all just kind of nodded. And most of them didn't read very much of it, and I they, I got very non committal comments back, and so. After a few months, I said, well, what's going on? So I took a look at my manuscript, and it was horrible. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. It was, it was not readable, and I was humiliated. And I stuck it in a drawer uh, for about two years. I just couldn't look at it. And uh, then uh, everybody kept asking me, what happened to your book? What happened to your book? So that's when I got really serious. And I said, well, my, the first attempt was because I held myself accountable. So right. I took the manuscript out and I, 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 I located a writing mentor online. I actually found someone online, uh, a lovely children's author named Susan Hughes, um, who was living in Nova Scotia at the time. And she, uh, would evaluate manuscripts for, you know, a price. And so I said, you know, the Canadian dollar is a good deal. I'm going to do it. (laughs) So I sent her the manuscript and she sent me back 30 pages of notes and, um, which was pretty daunting. Um, and, uh, it took me about a year to work through those notes on a rewrite. I sent it back to her and I got back 16 pages of notes took me about another year to work through those and revise. And by that time, I was outlining and editing and with her help and, and um, you know, pointing me in the direction of uh, other blogs and other examples of writing. Um, in t- two years, I made myself into a readable writer. And when and, she and, sent me back the manuscript the, the second time, she said, congratulations, you have a book. Oh, wow. But the important thing to, uh, to note here is that you had a book to edit. Uh, all of those other years talking about a book, uh, there's nothing for anyone to help you with until you have a book uh, to work on. That's, that is uh, correct. Y- yeah, yeah. That putting your butt in the chair and writing the thing uh, cannot be stressed enough. That nothing, uh, the book can't get better if there is no book. That that is right. And and, and again, uh, uh, I've always enjoyed that first 
rush because it's very improvisational. But the rewriting of the book is a slog. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you've got someone else telling you that, that you could do better and or, you know, in a in the nicest of uh, scenarios. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And she was yeah. a wonderful mentor. Yeah. And I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I praise her in my acknowledgement because she she was the one who sort of prodded me gently to keep at it. And um, I finally got into editing so much that, uh, you know, the book went down to about 240 pages from 360. Wow. And I just, I, I, wrote, I wrote her one day, I said, you know, if I keep at this, I guess this could become a haiku. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Um, so the importance of a book like this is to get uh, to a particular audience and to connect with that audience. Yeah. Uh, what sort of feedback have you gotten from your intended audience with this book? Well, what's been really lovely is um, uh, I, I've, I've, I've been on uh, – last year I was uh, selected as uh, – in the, in the, in the uh, category – as uh, uh, one of the best books of 2016 from Kirkus Reviews and from Indie Reader uh, listed me as one of the best books of the year on their on their children's lit list. Um, I've gotten about five awards on the book so far. I was a quarter finalist in the Book Life Prize for Fiction. Um, children's Literary Classics just gave me honorable mention. So um, the book has been you know, getting really good reviews and praise, and I'm thrilled. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, because writing a book uh, that that uh, gets uh, accolades is wonderful, but until uh, until it connects with people, that's... that's Yeah, uh, so that's, that's the next thing. Um, right. And for me, because uh, I, I got a publisher after only about 60 attempts... Um, but that publisher went out of business just as I was going to book fair in Chicago and I had to scramble. And I, so currently the book is a uh, self-published work. And, and thank God we live in a time where, where that book could be saved and, 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 and reach an audience, uh, you know, before the indie publishing revolution, uh, you know, there, there were hardly any options. Absolutely, that's, yeah. Uh, it, it, we're still in the fantastic. pros of the revolution. It's not fully developed yet. I don't think right. it, it has the same stature as uh, still the, you know, the big six uh, uh, publishing houses. But still, yeah, an author can get his work out there now, which is great. That's right. That's right. Uh, Gary, the, uh, the book is called The King of Average. And uh, what's coming up next from you? Well, um, I, I wrote, uh, again, it's one of these things they have to gestate in a drawer for a couple of years, but I've just pulled out my next book uh, to work on my first draft, and it's called The Benji Loper Caper. And uh, it's about two teenage boys. This actually happened to me. I was a limo driver in L.A., and uh, two teenage boys rented my limo to surprise their girlfriends on a date. And um, uh, I, I thought, I, I thought, you know, wouldn't that be funny if uh, when I was parked outside this very swanky restaurant that the kids got in the wrong limo on uh, after their date and got involved in a jewel robbery. <laughs> so basically, that's the book I'm writing. And I, I kind of say it's sort of Ferris Bueller meets Get Shorty. Oh, I love it. So, yeah, it's the adventures of these two kids uh, out on a date um, getting involved with uh, uh, a Russian jewel theft ring called the Pink Panthers. That's awesome. Uh, Gary Schwartz, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Hank, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Sure. sure. Uh, what is your website where we can send people to uh, to follow what's going on with you and uh, – and uh, the book that you just pitched, uh, I want to read it. So <laughs> let me know where, where we can follow that. Great. Uh, well, let's see. Um, uh, my website is gary-schwartz.com. That's with a hyphen. Gary-schwartz.com. And that has not only my, my book, 
um, uh, my blog, but also some videos of my career as an actor. Nice. Thanks for, uh, for coming on the show, Gary. Thank you, Hank. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves. Pick up the entire Jason Crane series. Link in the show notes. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table, finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire. It began to hiss and pop, the snow melted, and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. When she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door, she said. I obeyed. She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again! I deserved to be burned! She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lap board. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt. You've been listening to the Author Stories podcast with Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. When you're there, please subscribe to the show and leave a comment over on iTunes or Google Play.